Good morning, everybody. I know we have quite a few here today. And uh, how are you guys doing with Lab 7? Because I just extended the, the because I received so many um, different messages about those integrals. I extended the, uh, the deadline for it until this Sunday. And basically, for those who already submitted it, you can go back and rework it if you like. For those who still did not submit it, you have still more time. And uh, part of the difficulty, and I was actually going through your, uh, your syllabus for the course from uh, your instructor, is that you're supposed to have those integrals basically with you. But since you don't have them, or at least a lot of you apparently do not have them, so I extended it. And uh, I'm willing to extend another session, actually not today, because I have all the classes going on today, uh, to just go through those integrals if you like. I have a uh, access to actually a few tools in here. One of them is Mathematica. And actually, I can answer a few of the things uh, for you guys quickly today if you have any something quick. But uh, they require some work first. You need to prepare those integrals first before you put them on Mathematica or anything like that. Uh, at least three of you asked me almost the same question uh, on a separate, basically, uh, communication. I'd rather see those questions basically to be asked on, uh, on uh, the discussion board. That way, everyone will see that question. And if you see it asked, and somebody else can confirm it. That way, you know we have uh, the same thread instead of having basically to have separate messages for the same question. And uh, the other advantage of having it in a discussion board accessible to everybody else also is that uh, if somebody else has already an answer or have the integral table or something like that, they can immediately intervene and they say, you yeah, look, you can use this or that answer. Or the answer to that one is zero, and some of the actual integrals are zero. And uh, it would have saved a little bit of uh, of, uh, of time, but also, and it is actually so. There are three points basically for it. First of all, it benefits everybody, and the second is someone else can intervene. And the third point is that it, it established that interactions, which I really, really think it's very important for uh, during the learning process between everybody. So again, I am really encouraging everybody when they have a question on their mind. First of all, do not feel like, uh, okay, I probably should not ask because maybe people think I don't know or something. That is actually wrong. I mean, this is one of the uh, problems for basically uh, in education, and that is uh, shyness is really a big problem for it. You should really ask the question for, uh, for, uh, 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 for, for the entire class. And uh, the thing about that also is that you'll be surprised how many people actually will thank you because, first of all, sometimes they probably have the same, they were struggling with the same issue, or sometimes they don't think about it until you ask it. So they're very grateful for the fact that you stepped up and intervened and asked that question. So please do ask it and ask it in, uh, for everybody so that everybody can benefit from it and it expedites the process and makes it uh, much faster. Do I have... Uh, I'm hoping that this is actually from this point on, this is the process, okay? If you have a specific problem, let's say, for example, your computer is not working or you don't have the requirements that you're supposed to have or something like that, if it's a single issue for yourself, then maybe, yes. But if it's a general question like those questions that, uh, that came in, and some of them came in late, actually, uh, yesterday, about the integral, uh, I wish they would have been asked on the, on the discussion board. I'm not really... Uh, trying to pick on anybody, but I'm hoping that this is some sort of a process that we're all going through. Okay, so uh, any questions other than the integrals on lab seven? And you guys can ask in the chat or you can turn on your microphone and ask for... No, so the integrals are the headache, isn't it? I need some feedback from you guys. I mean, no, it's you. Yeah, table five. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me go through. I think most of the classes here, if not probably only one person or something, is not here or two most are not here. Okay. So let me go through those uh, those integrals first quickly to see, in a nutshell, how they look like and the plan moving forward. Okay. Yeah, apparently there's a consensus in here. I see it through your uh, your chat, uh, basically, questions. Okay, 
So let me find first of all where lab seven is. Here is lab seven. And let me go and share that screen with you guys. Okay. Do you guys see the screen in here for, uh, for lab seven? It's on a PDF file. I need some confirmation for that. Okay, very good. I have everybody to come. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Sometimes when I switch screens, when I go into full screen mode or uh, basically share screens, I don't see that chat thing. So I need some to make sure I'm not talking by myself about something and you guys are looking at something that is different. Okay. So all of this integral is basically, so we did one of them at least extensively last time around when we met and namely that was the Gaussian distribution, which was kind of easy, I guess, compared to the others. Not really, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a similar fashion. I expect table five. Okay, somebody asked about table five, I guess. Okay. Let me check so first of all to see if there is anything before table five. So this was about the Gaussian, we discussed that, okay. Table five. Table five, basically, you're supposed to do this integral. The, the, this, this column in here should be easy because all you have is a polynomial function, basically, p of x. And you're supposed to find the distribution in here, the, the, the constant a, so that this distribution, this probability is, is one, okay? So you integrate from negative one, that's the domain, to positive one, and uh, you make sure that this integral is one, that the probability of finding a particle in that region is 100%, basically, that's what you're saying. So uh, again, you follow the steps, of the integral from x min to x max of p sub x. This is a continuous distribution. That's why we're doing this. Uh, dx equals to one. I hope, I think this is calc two stuff. So you guys did that. So you should not have difficulty with this integral. When you integrate it in, in, in a region between negative and one and positive one, this delta x and this delta x cubed, they will give you zero contributions because those are odd functions integrated for on, on, on a symmetrical, basically bounded uh, domain. So in this case, there is a fundamental theorem that this integral from negative one to positive one of delta x, or x by itself, because delta is just a constant in here, a number that is between uh, negative one and positive one. So this plus gives you zero, and this plus gives you zero. We don't have to worry about those. The only part that we have to worry about is the integral from negative one to positive one and one, and that is two, because the integral of the constant is uh, is x evaluated between positive one and uh, negative one. So x, which is gonna be uh, one minus minus one, so it's gonna be two. So they're gonna, this part will give you two. And this one, negative x squared, when you integrate it, is gonna be negative one third of x cubed. And again, x cubed, which is one to the power three is one, minus minus one to the power three, that is also a negative one. One minus minus one, that is two, two over three, so that's a two thirds. So basically what's going on in here, you have one, I mean two minus two thirds times A equals two, basically uh, one. From here you find the normalization constant A. Does this need elaboration or are guys good? On this, at least this column. Okay. So this part in here is easy. So when you multiply it by X in here, I see more people are uh, coming in the chat in here. Okay, so the entire column is good. So this part in here is good. We don't have to worry about it. The problem with this column is this is a purely mathematical column as a matter of fact, because this constant A uh, over, the, it has to have something like one over distance or something like that. It's really not, uh, but the delta in here so basically, in terms of dimensions, this is not going to worry so much. Dimensionally, this has to make sense. This one is going to involve, at some point, if n is an integer, and they didn't specify that in here. If n is an integer, then this is actually the factorial function. Is this column also good? Should we spend time on it or n nothing at all? The second column. OK. Or anything is good. Anybody else? At least to make sure that everybody else. Okay. So maybe some explanation. Okay, let's talk about this column in here. The advantage of having the exponential in here is that the, uh, the uh, 
Let me stop this quickly just to show the trick behind the exponential because it's a powerful trick in here that is always is useful for the. Uh, so let me create a screen in here. Thing. Stop sharing that screen and go now and share another screen. Okay. First of all, let me look at the PDF file to make sure I have them. It doesn't matter really the name of uh, the exponent in here. It's exponential minus kx. Okay. Once you're dealing with the exponential, basically at some point you have exponential minus kx dx. Forget about this function in here, which is x to the power n. Uh, the trick in here is to basically note that the, uh, different, uh, the, 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 the derivative of the exponential is the exponential itself, except you have a constant in here to worry about. So in other words, negative one over k d sub exponential of negative kx is the same as that. It's exactly that, because when you take the differential of form of the exponential, you drop the negative k, which cancels the negative one over k, and you're back into this expression and here time is dx. So now you do the integration by parts, basically. That's all. So you have a function times, take the negative k out, times this function. So the first contribution of this integral is just the product of these two fun functions evaluated between the boundaries of the integration and the boundaries of integration. In this case, are negative infinity and positive infinity. And the exponential, I mean, from zero to infinity, I'm sorry, the, the domain, it's still, you can find at x equals to zero, this kills the exponential. At x equals to infinity, the exponential kills this power in here because it's, it goes to zero much faster than uh, the, the power in here. So uh, that is zero. So when you do the integration by parts, basically you're going to multiply the function here times the antiderivative of this function, which is this one, okay? And then evaluate it between the boundaries. And then you have a minus in the formula for the derivative by parts, I mean the, uh, the integration by parts. You have a minus times minus becomes positive, one over k times the derivative of, of this x to the power n, and that drops an n in here, times x to the power n minus one. That is the same exponential, and that is the advantage of doing the exponential. So basically what you will notice in here, you're going to repeat the process one more time, be dropping each time the power of n, so it's going to be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3. When are you going to stop? Until you reach the point n. Will you have n minus n, which is 0? x to the power 0 is 1, and you will be left with the integration of the exponential between 0 and infinity. And, and then uh, infinity. The integral of uh, the exponential is the exponential itself. At infinity, it's 0. At 1, I mean, at 0 is 1. So basically, you end up with a one times the, uh, the, the, the uh, factorial uh, uh, of n. So n factorial, basically. n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, if n is not an integer, which is not what is intended with this problem, so you have to assume that it's an integer, then you're dealing with something completely different, which is a gamma function. Okay? So... Uh, we're not going to worry about that at that point, so we're not going to we're not we're going to assume that n is an integer in this case. And I hope that most of you would have would have assumed in here. Did anybody else treat it as a gamma function? And I don't see my chat now. It's gone. When I just oh, it's probably because I'm on the wrong screen. Oh, it's gone completely. Did one of you, any one of you treat that column with the gamma function or all of you treat it with the factorial? Okay, so it's, it's fine, okay? And I know at least one of you did uh, with the factorial, that's how it's supposed to be in this integral anyway. So don't worry about the, uh, the, uh, the other nonsense when n is not an integer. So is this clear enough at least for some people give you a head start on it? And again, I'm gonna hold the session tomorrow morning for you guys, maybe at, uh, the same time, 8 o'clock from 8 to 9, just to go through this integral uh, to clear out anything just before the lab is due, okay? Just to give you an idea of to get you started so that you finish most of them and to give you about the plan before we actually meet on, uh, on tomorrow for those who are still needing help. First of all, I need you to confirm that at least one person is coming tomorrow so that I don't have to uh, be here by myself. And uh, 
What is that, uh, Melissa? Okay, very good. So we have a few people who are in here. So I'm going to show you basically the plan of action leading to tomorrow so that you, 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 you prepare your questions ahead of time correctly, okay? Because we shouldn't be spending a lot of time. And if it's, it's, not a, it's a good idea to send me the question ahead of time so that we prepare it before we meet so that we don't have to waste a lot of time on, uh, on trying to put the algebra together, okay? Because there is some work leading to the actual integral that needs to be done, okay? To make the integral as numerical as possible, not, uh, not uh, symbolic, okay? Okay. Uh, will the, tomorrow, yeah, I will record the meeting tomorrow and uh, I'll share it to you guys. So if you're working tomorrow and it's not planned class anyway, so we'll, I'll record it and put it uh, on Canvas for you guys, or YouTube actually, and then link it to Canvas. Okay? So let's go back into the, uh, the, uh, the PDF file again. Look at column three. For column three, this is a uh, function, basically as far as A is concerned, it's kind of easy a little bit, uh, because all you have to do is do a change of variable in here from X minus big X in here to a new variable called uh, Y, if you like to call it Y, uh, so that it's X minus X is equal to Y, okay? If DX and DY will be the same thing, and you will be uh, left with the integration between uh, uh, what is it, negative infinity to positive infinity of A over Y squared plus S squared, the whole thing squared. This is, uh, this is a common technique when you reach this one. When you did this two, basically, you dealt with the electric field, you dealt with the dipole, basically, of uh, the case of the uh, electric dipole, the magnetic field, and this expression comes often a lot, and it's because usually you're dealing with the radius, and the radius is given by the, uh, by the uh, uh, not the radius, I'm sorry, the hypotenuse of some triangle of some sort. In other words, you have a charge, you have a current, and then that current trying to find the magnetic field somewhere or the electric field somewhere, and the whole thing forms a right angle triangle, and this is basically becomes just a Pythagorean theorem where this is the x-axis, basically or one of the components of the right angle triangle and the other one, and that's basically the hypotenuse. So this expression is common there. And the technique there, and it's a common technique all the time, is to use the check uh, tra uh, transformation. Basically, you pull the S squared in here out of this integral. And then once you pull the S squared, you'll be left with one over one plus a ratio of two numbers, basically squared. You call that ratio some sort of a tangent, and then all of a sudden, the integral, instead of being from negative infinity to positive infinity, will change from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Because the arc tangent of negative infinity is the negative pi over 2, and the arc tangent of positive pi, uh, infinity is positive, uh, positive pi over 2. So now you have an integral between negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, and then everything in here will boil down to just some, uh, some trig uh, calculations, which is kind of easier to do. So almost all the time, when you're dealing with an integral like this one, you do the trick. Uh, tr at some point, you're going to convert it to some trick. Okay. Now, granted, when you do the x integration in here, that's going to be zero again. I'm sorry, it's not going to be zero in this case. Okay, you have to be careful. It was zero somewhere else, except in here, it's not because this function, when you multiply it by x, is not going to be an odd function. Okay, because of this x minus x. So when you change x. The negative x, this is not going to be zero, but it's going to involve some trig function at some point. So don't worry about that. <laughs> so it's not going to be hard, okay? It should be easy enough to do, okay? And the average will have to do with this x. The actual a should not be dependent on x. When you do the transformation, the x is done, so we don't have to worry about it. So it only depends on s, but uh, that's the normalization factor a, will not depend except on s, but this average will depend on x, this big x. Same thing with x squared. And all of them will involve the trig, uh, trig transformation, okay? Are you guys familiar with this? Did you do that in physics too? Did you do this transformation a lot trying to calculate those fields? Or you don't remember? One of the two, okay? Either you did them and you don't remember them or you didn't do them. Okay, very good. That's, <laughs> that's an honest answer from Melissa. <laughs> okay. 
most of the time that's what happened. I mean, you're busy in the class and trying to do things. And uh, then when the class is over, especially for you guys, since there was a lapse of time between physics two and physics three, so it's, you know, I kind of understand that. Okay, so this is basically a typical thing to do when you're doing that. So again, just in a nutshell, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that we should discuss this one tomorrow because I think this is easy enough. Do you guys, do you guys see that or not? Or should we give you at least a little bit more pointers right now than just talking about it, maybe on that? Yes? No? Should we move on or not to the next table? Need some feedback in here. Okay, very good. Okay, very good. If not, again, just ask it later on and say, okay, this is, but again, please may ask the question in the discussion board so that maybe somebody else has a better or quicker way of doing these things. That way we save time, okay? Okay, so let's go to the uh, next tables. So in here, it's really about the wave form. That's a, something that you have seen actually in physics one when you were doing the waves on string and sound waves. And then when you went to physics two, actually you did this one also with the electromagnetic uh, waves when you have, uh, when you are in, uh, in, uh, in um, free space, basically there are no currents in free space and there are no charges in free space. And you solved Maxwell's equations, and you found them. They actually obey this uh, this uh, this equation, which is the wave equation. So if there is a source, like for example, a star that emitted, or even light source like the one that we have in here, emitted a, a, a an electromagnetic wave, an electromagnetic basically disturbance in space, namely that you have an electric field and a magnetic field. That one will travel with the speed t, which is just the one over square root of this numbers in here, m u naught epsilon naught. And that is going to be the, uh, it's going to be a wave basically where you have the electric field and the magnetic field oscillating and basically hitting your eye and your eye interpret it as different colors basically depending on the wavelength and the wavelength is given by the dispersion law. So this is the stuff that you have seen sometime at least for physics two and physics three. And again, like I said, this thing for you guys probably happened a little bit a long time ago and you don't remember a lot of the details for it, but this is a wave equation. Okay. Whenever you're doing a math problem, or a physics problem, and you hit this equation, that is your ha-ha moment. That's when you say, okay, I know what that is. That's actually a wave. Once you have the partial derivative with the spatial the parameters in here, minus, and you need the minus in here, one over some positive number, which you later on square root it and call it the velocity of the wave, times the partial derivative with the respect to the temporal uh, behavior, the time, you say, I know, I know what that is. I don't have to spend a lot of time finding it. I know it's a wave. In the case of a harmonic wave, it's given by the sine or the cosine function. And basically, that's what you go about finding it. And from there, you find the dispersion law, which is this one. And this is actually the dispersion law. The rate at which I mean, the, and the frequency are uh, related to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the speed, in this case, for the case of light. Okay? Well, it turns out that actually particles behave in similar fashion too. They have actually wave components and uh, Schrodinger's equation is actually a complex equation as you can see, have, you have seen already in lecture. And uh, I met a lady actually somewhere else. She was in a different field other than the sciences. She was not an engineer and she was not actually also in math or physics or any of the science or chemistry or anything like that. And she told me one of the things that she learned in school and she found it kind of very useless thing. She has never seen it in her life was the complex numbers. And I told her, and I didn't know at that time what she was actually doing. I told her it did not take uh, upper division physics classes or engineering classes to, uh, to say that, or chemistry classes, because if you do, first of all, you will know that it's a very powerful technique to solve a lot of the math problems, number one, and physics problems two, and number two, it's actually, uh, the, uh, Schrodinger's equation is actually a complex equation. So <laughs> you cannot do much without it. But again, you see the I here all over the place, okay? And that is coming from the, uh, and then at the end, it becomes a wave, it becomes a wave equation. But remember, the, uh, the, the complex number is, uh, is, is, is not real. 
to the end, the measurements in the lab have to be real. The position of the electron, the electron or uh, the energy or its momentum or any quantity that we want to measure has to be a real quantity. And that is why at the end, the probabilities do not involve any of those complex numbers. Basically, you're going to have a function multiplied by its complex conjugate, and at the end, whatever, uh, whatever uh, imaginary part basically cancels out, and you will end up with a real star. But the energy, as you can see it in here, uh, itself is an operator, a temporal operator is a complex operator, the position is actually scalar, and the momentum also is a complex operator. So when you're doing that, basically, and you're solving, this is Schrodinger's equation again, which is, has the I in it, and this is like your F equals to MA in quantum mechanics. This is the fundamental law, basically, like a principle, okay? Uh, the wave equation here, again, is a complex uh, function, and then at the end of the day, basically, what happens you do the calculations is just averages, okay? We have three cases in here. Did everybody navigate column one of this table, or you have some difficulty with column one? I need some feedback in here. Okay, so people think that column one is good. Again, don't forget you're supposed to square this thing. Okay, this is probably what's going to get you into trouble for this one. Yes, okay, that's case question. Yes, in order to find A in here, you have to do that, okay? You have to square the sign in here multiplied by a and make sure that this basically probability namely a squared sine squared between uh, what is it the boundary of the integration zero and a is equal to one and that gives you a condition on a okay uh, something that you probably have uh, seen actually uh, somewhere also when you were doing physics one and physics two and that is the sine function is a periodic function that is at sometimes positive and sometimes is negative. But uh, when you square it, it's always positive. So when you square a sine function, it's always positive. So when you, when you average a function that is exactly positive at some point and negative at some point, because it's in, you will find this is zero average basically from uh, during a cycle, during a period, okay? But uh, when, you have, when you square it, both sides are positive. So it definitely is going to have a value in here that is not zero. Same thing in here. And uh, usually that is the RMS for the voltage when you were doing physics two, or when you were doing the power again for a wave that is on a string or sound waves, for example, the decibels and the intensity of sound and things like that. So again, uh, uh, that involves the, some harmonic function in there and that is basically the key for that. So again, in here, you're going to do just the integral, and the integral of sine squared or cosine squared involves a trick. And the trick is the cosine of twice the angle. Cos, there is an identity from trig uh, classes. Cosine of two alpha is equal to two cosine squared minus, sine, or minus one, or equals to cosine squared minus sine squared, or one minus two uh, times sine squared. That trig identity is what helps us do this integral all the time. And of course, if you convert this one back to complex numbers, it's even easier to do, okay? It doesn't matter. Both methods should give you the same answer. And usually the average is one half times something, once you put all of the arguments in here. So this is for this part in here, the x, again, will just make it even, I mean, odd function. And you have to basically work with, if you're integrating through a whole cycle, it's gonna be zero, okay? So you have to work your way through this. This is going to do, again, the bipart thing. The advantage of doing this way is at some point you're integrating, uh, when you do the bipart, the, uh, the antiderivative of the sine is a co uh, cosine, I mean a negative cosine, and the antiderivative of a cosine is actually the sine, and this is a cyclic operation, so you can do it just enough to get rid of that power, uh, x to the power one, or x to the power two, or x to any power. So this part is easy. I guess most of you have probably done this one or looked it up, and it's not hard. Column two now with the exponential. This is similar to what I discussed earlier, okay? Except the other one had x to the power n, this one x to the power one, 
and the k here is negative one over b. Do you guys see that this is exactly like the other example? If you worked out the other example, you should be able to do this one too. This is actually a little easier than that. Actually, the formula that you find from there, let's plug it in here. Yes? Okay, so this is easy. Uh, and this caution here, this cosh requires some work. And basically, I think one of you or two of you asked about this one specifically. And uh, I was trying to do it and then said, forget about it because it started to involve some basically uh, special functions. I think, what is it, the polylog function. So I abandoned that shot completely because I had some other things to do for other classes. I'm <laughs> sorry. So what they did in here is they went through Mathematica basically and converted the integral into some uh, basically a number at the end after you, uh, it's easy basically. The preparation is making sure that cosine of kx at the end, the integral doesn't involve anything. Let me quickly show you because this is necessary for what we're gonna do tomorrow, okay? So I'm gonna show you exactly how you can do this one and for anything else to prepare it for yourself, to put it on any kind of a numerical calculator like for example, Mathematica or MATLAB or uh, I don't know GeoGebra if it does this kind of integrals or not, it's powerful enough to do it or not, or uh, something so that you can get the answer quickly, okay? So let me show you guys uh, for how to handle this kind of integrals in general, to prepare them so that they become a numerical integration, not, not symbolic integration, because if you do symbolic integration, it's gonna give you those special functions, and then you will be looking for the value of those special functions for the given, uh, numbers that you have for your case, and it's gonna be, a, uh, it's gonna be a, a lot of work again. So let's do the work once and for all, and then do the calculation. So let me stop sharing the screen. So I have to integrate between negative infinity and positive infinity, this integral a squared over cosh squared dx, and make sure that number is equal to one. You guys agree on this plan? Yes? to find A basically, at least. Okay, so we're gonna do that. So I'm gonna go back into my screen in here to prepare that integral. So I'm gonna go and share, and share this screen. Okay, so, so here is the task, I'm saying one, is equal to the integral, let me make this screen a little bit bigger. The integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, a squared over cosh squared of kx dx. A is constant, so it's gonna come out of the integral, but before I do that, I want to make a change of variable. This is the trick for it. You want to have your dummy variable by itself inside the integral, and everything else basically pulls out, okay? And then what, at that point, you start looking up what, the, what that integral looks like. So what you say in this case in here is, look, I'm gonna make kx my new variable. You can call it x if you like. I mean, there is no harm about it, but then you have to pay attention to what happened to uh, which x you're talking about. I'm gonna call it y because it's any, any variable would do in here because at the end, it's not gonna, the x is not gonna appear part of the answer. This whole thing is just a function of a squared and or a itself and k, okay? So the answer in here should depend on only on those two numbers. So once you do that change of variable, then it becomes k dx is dy. So k is just a constant. Then I have my dx in this expression. I have my, uh, in terms of dy, I have kx is equal to y. And the boundaries of integration do not change because when x goes to negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity because I remind you that k was specifically in this problem positive. They say that, okay, k is not given in here, but it should be at the end, it's the, what is it, the wave number? So it's gonna be a positive number, okay? So since it's a, the wave number, the wave number is always positive. So this is a physics problem. This is not some mathematical problem where you're going to say k can it be negative. It doesn't, cannot be negative. It's a wave number. So k is positive. So when x goes to negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity, and y, y goes to, uh, when x goes to positive infinity, so is y. So the boundaries of integration do not change, and the one must then be equal to the negative infinity integral 
positive infinity, again, a squared, dx is dy over k, so I have a squared over k times now the integral of dy now over cos squared of kx, and kx is y. So now I pull the a squared over, uh, over k by itself, and I have the answer basically as far as ready to go to a calculator. So I say 1 is equal to a squared over k, the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of dy over cos squared of y. That's what I need you to do for tomorrow, before tomorrow, actually. I need you to prepare all of your integrals so that they don't have anything in them except just ready to be going into a numerical calculator. Okay, I'm interested to know what is the uh, integral between negative infinity and positive infinity of one of cosh squared of x, doesn't matter. You might have a tinge somewhere or you might have an x squared there or something. That is not the problem. At that point, we're ready to go to something else, and uh, I find mathematics a little easier to handle in this case than, uh, than math lab, because the, the, the terminology is kind of easier. That's why I use Mathematica for this purpose. I mean, usually I have, for anything, you have some other things. So at that point, and I already sent you the, uh, the printout from Mathematica, and uh, just to show you basically how you're, uh, are you guys familiar with Mathematica or MATLAB or any of this uh, powerful tools? Did you have, did you use them at all in your classes? Okay, very good. So at least I have some people who do know that. Okay, if you're not familiar, it's not, I mean, there is actually an online version of Mathematica on their, on their, uh, on their website. For welcome, uh, basically. I got this one from an IT and a college. I don't even, long time ago. So uh, let me stop sharing the screen quickly and go to the Mathematica notebook. Share. Okay, so basically this is a notebook I started with uh, yesterday. I'm gonna go in here just to show you that this integral can be done in here. Oops, what am I doing here? So uh, the trouble with it is, is if you, if you do symbolic man manipulation, mathematics are actually very good for it. You're gonna get some nonsense functions in it. Not nonsense functions, functions that basically are not too helpful, let's put it this way. Oh, okay. I'm sharing with you the screen, yes. Do you guys see Mathematica to make sure that it's a notebook that I'm sharing? Yes, no? I can't see the chat right now because I'm in this screen in here. I need some confirmation. Yes, verbal confirmation because again... Yeah, we can see it. Okay, very good. So, we said... Here is the thing with Mathematica. It's case sensitive, just like most programming languages. And uh, if you start typing, it has this uh, intelligence that's going to help you. You want to do a numerical integration. That's basically an integral versus an integration, which is supposed to be symbolic integration. If you do symbolic integration, you have to specify the, basically the variable with which you want to integrate. Okay, so in here, we're going to do an n integral, and it uses this. The, the straight brackets instead of the uh, regular brackets for anything. It's like the parentheses, basically. Then I want to integrate, what did we say we want to integrate? One over, and I'm going to get the cosh. Again, the cosh is a built-in function, okay? Cosh, again, because it's a function, and the argument of the function, just like the n integrate in here, needs the uh, straight uh, uh, bar in it. And then the, the, the variable is x. So yes, we called it y. And because it's a dummy variable, you can call it whatever you like to. So I can call it y in here, but it's a common people that to use x for the variable, okay? So uh, you can change the name of the variable whenever you want to. That's why it's, it's not gonna appear in the answer. Cos squared, okay? So that's basically the language that is, and this is basically how actually also uh, uh, a lot of the tools actually use the symbols for the, uh, the carrot for the power and the division is the backslash and things like that. So those are the common techniques. Plus is plus, minus is minus. The star is multiplied and so on and so forth. Okay, so the integration is over x and it's the region is from negative infinity. Infinity, again, this is case sensitive mathematics. I always starts with the, at least for a lot of the things, that's with capital letters, infinity. And uh, it ends at positive infinity. You don't need, again, to put positive in here. It knows that it's positive. 
and you close this one. So the first one, you state the variables you are integrating over, the boundaries of integration, and then don't forget to close that uh, parameter. In order to execute an operation in Mathematica, you have to do shift enter, and it's gonna give you the answer. And the answer is two. So this whole number is two, okay? If you did it actually with the hand, and if you want to just find the entire derivative, this is the entire derivative of, of that function, integrate of, uh, what is it, the, uh, the function itself, Okay, let me copy it. I just I don't want to do the whole thing. Can I copy this thing here? Yep. Accept. Well, I don't know if I need the uh, curly braces. Oops, the curly braces are not. Okay, that's the tinge of X, okay? One over cos squared is the entire derivative of, uh, of, the, uh, of the tench, okay? Remember, the tench is, uh, you guys are, do you remember the hyperbolic functions from your math classes? Yes? Let me stop sharing, so at least this is going on. Yeah, do you guys remember the hyperbolic functions? Okay, very good. So then at least, that could help at least with this function in here. Because the, uh, the, uh, the, what is it called? The secant squared or whatever it's called. That is basically the entire derivative of the, or the, the derivative of, of, uh, of the tension itself. So column three should not be too hard, actually, if you remember this thing. If not, please prepare your integrals. And the technique behind it is make the integral at the end just basically a number, like this one. The integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, one over cos squared is, a number, cos squared of y or x, dx. So that's what I want you to do for all of your integrals in here, to prepare them that way. That is basically what I need you to do. If you have difficulty with that, please specify exactly which problem you're working on, and then we, you, you let me know. If we multiply this function by x, and again, integrate it, it's gonna be an odd function between negative infinity and positive, it should be zero, and you can do it actually by parts, and you should find it to be zero, okay? Anyway, that should be fine. That uh, again for the x squared, prepare these functions. When you're preparing them, don't forget to get rid of this nonsense stuff. Does this make a little bit better sense now? I know at least one of you had asked me several times yesterday. We worked on it until we, yes, very good. Okay, so this table is, I hope that it's workable. Now the next table requires some upfront work first, okay? All of these functions are single variable functions. Basically, you're doing the one-dimensional uh, 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 particles. You're not doing the multi-dimensional ones. So basically, you're working in just one dimension. So all of these operators in here, just take the Cartesian coordinate system. Don't worry about the polar or spherical. And if you're doing, for example, uh, the Laplacian, and at some point you will need it, just work on this derivative in here. Don't worry about dy over the uh, d with respect to y or d with respect to z. So when you try to calculate the kinetic energy in this case in here, or uh, you're, you're not going to be doing, dealing, converting into any other uh, coordinates, at least for this one. This is for your general formation, which you already have in class. Okay. Same thing for the angular momentum in here. It's going to be something that involves but we don't have, uh, we don't do 2D or 3D to even worry about that at this point. We're not doing rotation, but at some point probably we'll be concerned with it. Okay, uh, this is the momentum. So it's just the first one in here. This is the position, it's the first one in here. The energy is going to be only uh, X dependent and probably time also, and uh, so on and so forth, okay? So uh, in this case, for example, you're de dealing with, because now we're doing with the single variable, we don't have to worry about those partials, basically, they become straight out derivative. So if I'm trying to find the uh, momentum, all I have to do is just basically take the derivative of the function and uh, multiply it by the function itself. So at some point, you're gonna have the a squared, which is constant, and you're taking 
This is why this one is a little bit more work because of that extra step that you have to do versus the position which is taking this derivative. Okay. So this function, let's go through the table in here to make sure that we have in here and understand. So I'm trying to find Px in here. I have to multiply this function by h bar over i, namely h over 2 pi i, then square this a, multiply by sine of n pi x over a, times the derivative of this thing with respect to x. I'm gonna put an a, and we're gonna put an n pi over a, I'm sorry, times the whole thing, and the sine becomes a cosine, and I have to integrate it, okay? I have to integrate it between zero and a. And again, there is an identity in here in trig that says the, the sine times cosine, because once you take the derivative of sine, it's gonna be a cosine. So you'll have a sine from the first part times a cosine from the second part, and there is a uh, times cosine alpha is equal to one half of sine of two alpha. So basically that's a trig identity. That should help you with this part. Same thing in here. You're gonna take the derivative of the derivative because the operator px squared now introduces the second derivative. So remember the it is in here somewhere. Basically it's this operator squared. It's gonna be negative h bar times the second derivative with respect to x. Okay, here. This is the kinetic energy, which is p squared over 2m. So forget the 2m, it's negative h bar times this parameter in here. So again, you're going to do that. So it's going to be the derivative of the derivative. And the derivative of the cosine is going to involve a negative cosine now. So a negative sine, I'm sorry. So you already have a negative times a negative will be positive because the negative cosine will put the negative from it. The derivative will pick up another negative, and you already have a negative. So that takes care of the sine at least. And then the sine times sine is sine squared. Then again, you're back to the very first situation that we started with in table one, or the previous table, I guess, in here. Table, uh, what is it, six in here? So you should be back in there. And uh, that is, again, the function here. Is this column, I expect that this should not be a problem. You have delta px now, which is uh, defined by the square root of px squared minus uh, px squared, basically the square of the average of the squares minus the square of the average. And you have delta x from the previous table somewhere in here. Here. And you're going to multiply the two and check Heisenberg identity in here. OK? And whether or not, because at some point you'll be asked the question, does it still hold true? The, uh, the uncertainty principle of uh, Heisenberg. This is still true, hold true in this case too, and it should, okay? Then you have calculated this one divided by 2m, that should give you the kinetic energy, the average of ux, since you already have ux in here, that's gonna be zero in this case because there is no energy in here. And the total energy, which is just this number. Does this column make sense to you guys? Okay, so, yeah, uh, more math in it, and they are more precise, actually. That's what quantum mechanics is. One of the most precise sciences there. Okay, although it's built on probability, it's kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> but that's basically what it is, okay? You can do a, a calculation in quantum mechanics and push it all the way to so many digits after the decimal points with a huge precision in it, and go to the lab and find it match. That is something that is amazing. No other science can claim that, whether it's in physics or non-physics. So that's to show you how powerful this stuff is, okay? So uh, I know most of you are probably are not gonna be physicists, they're gonna be engineers, and down the road probably you don't care about that, and you have other things to worry about, then, uh, then this integrals, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of what you're facing with. And then, of course, if you have to do something and your boss is asking you to submit a report by seven o'clock tomorrow morning before the board meeting, you can go and get something like Mathematica or something and do the integral for you guys and submit the report and tell them, hey, we need to put more uh, basically support for this something that you're building, otherwise it's gonna collapse, okay? So that's basically what you're gonna be doing most of the time, you're gonna be engineers, but uh, if you're doing physics or you're gonna be in anywhere near this area, you really need to have a full understanding of what these things are. Besides, you really have to have a full understanding of what this thing is expected to at least pass this uh, 
the flower. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the hydrogen atom in here, the this is just similar to the previous two examples that are in there, except now we have to take this derivative. And this derivative in here, respect to x, has two components with it. The first one will take care of the derivative of x, and that will just leave the exponential basically uh, unexposed. And then the derivative of the exponential will just drop this minus one over ab, and that would leave just the, uh, the uh, this, uh, exponential again by itself times x, and in either case, we're back to that example from way up that we were dealing with uh, the uh, the one that you guys said involved the uh, factorial function. A lot of you did. Okay, I expect this one is actually not hard. Actually, too, all you have to do is just make sure you apply the operator in here once for the derivative with respect to x. You apply it twice in here. Don't forget you will dro be dropping negative signs all over the place in here because of that uh, i squared. Okay, and again, you find delta px with just the square root of this number minus this one squared, and you're going to find delta px, and don't forget that you already have calculated delta x from way up, and you're going to compare the two, you multiply the two, and at the end, you check whether or not the Heisenberg uncertainty principle still holds or not. Calculate px squared, that's going to be the energy, the kinetic energy that is, the potential energy is given in here, where is she? There she is basically, and uh, that's the average again, you multiply by this squared in here, and, uh, don't, and you already calculated A, by the way, A is you found it already from the previous table, table, uh, uh, the previous table that is, okay? And now you have uh, E, which is just the sum of these two numbers. Does this table make sense to you guys too? Yes, no? Okay, very good. Okay, how do you write fractions? Just like I did them for, uh, for example, in Adobe, just basically use the following convention. So this is numerator over denominator. And make sure you do the grouping basically with the parentheses. So if I have a num numerator times, I'll, I'm gonna, this is the whole thing is my numerator which involves some e to the power of something in here, negative 4 uh, divided by 2x. I don't know. I'm just typing numbers in here just to, because there was a question by, uh, who's that? Uh, actually, uh, Joseph. And I'm trying to answer it. So this whole thing is divided by, so do some grouping in here. Hopefully the expression will be a little bit easier than, than this, by 7 plus u to the power uh, negative two, for example. I don't know, I'm just writing this thing. Make sure that you're, you match the parentheses correctly, okay? This is in the chat. The question is, uh, is the ask, I just put it on the chat in here. Somebody asked that they can see uh, my screen. Joe asked, how can we write fractions and exponents? So I gave him a couple of uh, examples in there. Joseph, do you see it on the chat or not? Okay, very good. So basically, that's how you would write things. I mean, just to, that is the convention that everybody writes, basically, when you don't have access to a, a good uh, math, basically, a typesetting software like LaTeX. Okay, I know that some of you mentioned that you do have access to it. I think you do from this class. But if you do, please, that is actually the best way to go because you can write anything you like. Okay? And as a matter of fact, you can export stuff from a lot of other languages to later, including uh, Mathematica. Okay? Okay, does this answer your question? Joseph? Okay, very good. So, we don't, I expect we don't have a problem with this column, but if you do, please do not hesitate to ask because I don't want you to be sitting looking at something and you say, so it makes sense to me now, and then later on when you're trying to work it out, you'll have difficulty and time is coming rushing, and I know I extended the deadline, but please make sure you do this one. It should not be hard to do, including this column. Yes? 
This sounds good, okay. Uh, for this column again, we did this uh, earlier. We did this one before, except now we have to do the derivative, okay? This will be a little bit more work, so you have to basically take the derivative of our one over cosh, and one over cosh will involve some work in here. And don't forget you're gonna multiply it by cosh in here, so the derivative of our cosh is what, uh, cinch. So you'll have a minus cinch divided by cosh squared, so it's going to be minus cinch over cosh, or secinch times a uh, cinch, and times a cosh again, one over cosh again. So this expression will involve the hyperbolic uh, functions basically all over the place. If you don't have time and you have to go and feed the dog or take care of the cat or something, then just basically just put it in some sort of an easier way and send it, and then we'll put it on, ca on uh, the calculator and give the answer as quickly. Does this sound better? Yes, but at some point I expect that sometime in the summer, especially now when you're sitting at home and you don't have much to do, you can just start doing this thing or for the Taylor series and start to calculating stuff. Yes, basically that's the, the case what she's saying basically. Is that okay, let's just do the derivatives. Yes, because of that Px and Px squared, okay? So it's just similar to the average for the position function from the previous table, except that one did not have much derivative. Basically, you just multiply by x or x squared, then you integrate. In this case, you have to do some derivations first and there are integrations. And at the end, the purpose of this whole thing so that you have an understanding of this, you calculate the energies and make sure that the Heisenberg principle works. It's a lot of work and the, uh, the, the, the payoff actually is not bad. Actually. Okay. For different, of course, uh, 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 different, what is it? Uh, different potential, basically. Did you guys decide on how your exam is going to look like or not? Because it's, it's going to be a printed exam. I think they should prepare you for it. And this, at least for my classes, that's what I do with them. Actually, this. Labs turn out to be a good preparation for their exams, too. Did you decide on the format for the exam? Or not yet? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so at some point, you're going to check to make sure that that number is always the product of delta x is that question eight after that, and that's it. So that's lab seven. So basically, from now on until tomorrow at eight o'clock in the morning, I expect some of you that's working on it, they have difficulty, try to convert it into something that is e easy to integrate. If they can't find it, if they don't know how to convert, please let me know before tomorrow, eight o'clock in the morning, I want to look at this integral from that table. And can you please work it out with me tomorrow morning or something like that? And please ask that in the discussion board so that if somebody else has something already worked out, that saves time. So we're ready to move on to the new lab now. Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen in here, and I'm gonna pull the next lab, actually, let me find it for a second. I posted it actually on uh, on Canvas, didn't I? I think I did. Posted it yesterday. So, what's happening here? Let me take the attendance quickly here, because I know I think there is only one person who is not here with us today. For your uh, lecture, are you guys holding it live also? Because I can see the link on uh, Canvas. Yeah, can't find them. Okay, very good. And uh, okay.
So uh, let me uh, stop sharing now the, the attendance quickly here. Let me go into what is Lab 8. Okay, so I guess I have to show more windows in here. I'm trying to find where I put lab A's because I have so many windows open and I cannot find which one that's not it. That's and that's wrong. Uh, okay, here it is. Sorry. Okay, so this is lab eight. The next lab that is due a week from today, actually. Uh, before I decide on the deadline, it may change because they have come up with something called Blabster right now. And uh, what is it, Blabster? Or I put the link for you guys on our canvas to make sure that yeah, it's a Labster, not Blabster. Basically, it's not a, it's not LO, it's LA. Okay, I can put the link actually on canvas. And at this point, the labs that I already actually sampled are not exactly what I was hoping to see. So I don't know if we'll have our lab in there or not. At least there is a portion of that calculation that needs to be, uh, okay, where is my screen now? Okay, so you're looking at the hydrogen atom uh, file, aren't you? Okay, very good. So this portion, there are two portions or three portions. Of it. One of them we cannot do at least for right now until either I figure out some sort of a simulation on GeoGebra or something else where I can give you the links for it or work out this thing with the new thing that I posted, like I said, on Canvas and hopefully we can find an activity that we can modify there to do the actual part of the calculation to the, uh, the extra parts of the lab. Otherwise, the calculations, they should not be, actually they are a little bit easier than lab seven. Basically, this is the hydrogen atom now. And the hydrogen atom, basically, you have the energy levels in here. You have all of this. Question one was kind of easy, basically. It's a pure algebra. Question one, all you have to do is just do some manipulate these equations in here, one after the other, equation one and equation two. And you should be able to find the radius in here or using Niels Bohr model. So basically, what Niels Bohr thinks is some sort of a like a some sort of a solar system, that's what the atom is. Of course, it turns out to be, there's some flaws in it, and the biggest flaw is the fact that, hey, a particle that is accelerating, and it is accelerating in a circular path because of the centripetal acceleration, should uh, emit uh, basically radiation, and that radiation should slow down. So lose energy continuously until it falls down on the atom. So this model is not stable. So this is not correct. Okay? So no atoms, basically all atoms should collapse on themselves if this model were to be correct. Calculate A naught, you can get alpha in here, the numerical value H bar, you know what this value is, it's H over two pi, the mass of the electron. Uh, the, this is Ke, this is one over four pi epsilon naught, by the way, Ke is nine times 10 to the power nine. This is a constant, okay? This is the, uh, and the E squared is 1.6 10 to the negative 19. So you have all of these numbers to find what the, uh, what the radius, uh, Bohr's radius is, it turns out to be very close to actually from the correct value that the, uh, the quantum mechanics actually gives you too. And alpha in here, which is just a fine uh, structure constant, which is just the V, the velocity calculated from the previous divided by the speed of light. Anyway, I expect no problems, questions one and question two. Question three is actually also you combine back and you find that this is has some value which is E naught over N squared and you calculate E naught. And the easiest way to do it honestly is to keep everything in SI, including the value of H bar, including the value of Ke, which is one over four pi uh, epsilon naught, which is nine, nine times 10 to the power nine. But don't forget you square it, so it's gonna be 10 to the power 18, actually 10 to the power 19 when you consider that nine squared is uh, 8.1. And you have e to the power four now, which is negative 19 times four. So you have a bunch of powers in here. And don't forget you have in here 10 to the negative 34 squared, so it's 10 to the negative 64. 
if a bunch of powers at the end of the day and E naught is going to be something like what 13.6 or 13.2 uh, electron volts or something like that so once you divide the whole number by this ratio okay convert it to electron volts and uh, you use this expression now to calculate different tables in here. So for this table, it should be straightforward. First of all, you find the different energy levels, E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, E6. All you have to do is divide that E0 by the numbers. What is the, uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, one squared, two squared, four, three squared, and so on and so forth. So once you find E0, an electron volt, that's the unit you're using in here, divided by one square, divided by four, divided by nine, divided by 16, divided by 25, and there's a 64, and you'll find the different values in here, okay? Remember, e, non, e, non, e, e to the power n has a negative sign in it, okay? So all of these numbers will be negative numbers, correct? Then you're going to take this expression, and you find delta E where N initial and N final are in here. This is N initial is one, N final is two. So you plug in one for NI and two for NF in this expression. What is she? Yeah. Let's apply the whole thing. So you have one over N initial, which is one over one squared, minus one over two squared, which is one over four. So it should give you three, four times E naught. So this is going to be a negative number. This is going to be a positive number, the same number, okay? Because well, now they flipped, that's all. And you're going to do your calculations in here, okay? Then you're going to find the lambdas going for this, this expression. So this is table two. Table three, you're going to find the lambdas, and here is the expression for the lambda in here. Lambda is going to be a positive number, okay? Because delta E is going to be a negative number. So again, you're going to fill in your, 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 your numbers in here. And that is this part. Now, we're done. If this is all we're done. The data collection, we can do it at this point. Again, I'm going to either come up with some sort of a simulation or some sort of number for you guys to work off of. And uh, you do that. OK? So at this point, the questions that remain, they all have to do with that. So there are two parts of it. Part of it that should be done quickly and actually much quicker than lab seven. And the other part requires some data or uh, some uh, simulation. Any questions about lab eight? Did you guys have a glance at it or not yet? Uh, yeah, our exam is going to be next Thursday. OK, very good. So the exam is next Thursday. Did he tell you guys when the exam is going to be? I mean, the time? Is it during the lecture? Yeah, during the lecture, yeah. OK, very good. Okay, so uh, for this lab, lab eight, that is, at this point, you can do the first part very quickly. I expect there is no difficulty with it. And the second part, that probably will uh, have to work on it. And at this point, I don't have a 100% solution for it. Because either we go after or I give you some simulations that you guys can run the, uh, the, the numbers and get your data so that you can finish it. Don't forget, uh, there are a few people who committed already to tomorrow morning. I'll be more than happy to be here with you guys, but please work out your integrals first and let me know so that we can prepare them. We don't have to spend a lot of time basically preparing things when they should be, have been prepared. And if you have difficulty preparing them, please let me know and then we'll prepare them together for tomorrow. I have classes that today, two more classes, but then after that I should be, uh, be free for you guys to prepare those. Sounds a good plan? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you don't have any questions, everybody, I have to see, see some other people in here, no more questions. If you guys don't have any more questions, I wish you the best of luck. Don't forget, your lab has been extended to Sunday. For this lab, that seems to have given you a little bit of headache. And that uh, for those who submitted it, they can already, uh, they can or they can always resubmit it if they feel that there are things that need to be uh, changed or something. Have a good rest of the day, and I guess I'll see you tomorrow morning for some, 
and for everybody Thursday morning. But before you go, um, just double checking yeah. that you're, we have to wait for you to finish that second part of Lab Eight. You can do lab the first part already. Yeah. Okay. The second part. The second part is when we meet on Thursday. I would have definitely worked out some new information okay. for you guys, either one way or the other. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. You too. Bye.